Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. We're going to go straight to you now on the phone line, Cindy on line 5. Hello, Cindy. You're on the line. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I just wanted to make a few points um, in regards to the caller and the gentleman who was speaking. The focus is not on black only, it's only on a black focus. So we're looking at positive black role models and achievements as the basis for our learning. So we're not only looking at segregating, we're looking at bringing, I guess, um, a new dimension into what we learn. Cindy, are you any and part of that process by any chance? Pardon? Are you a part of the process? No, I wish I was, to be honest with you. Um, the other gentleman had said that race is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I'm a black woman, and I have a BA and an MA. And trust me, nobody can tell me that race is irrelevant, because it's still around. And I think that when we have black positive schools, it's about making us feel better of who we are. It's about giving us an anchor so we can be a better part of society. It's not about segregation. Okay, thanks for your call, Cindy. We're going to get, yes, you have something to say about this. Yeah, I just wanted to address that. I mean, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that race isn't taken into account. I'm saying race shouldn't be taken into account. It should be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And if we don't teach kids that, uh, they won't learn it. If we set them up in schools where they have role models that match their skin color, what we're teaching mm -hmm. them is that race is very relevant and that your achievement, your likelihood of success in the future is based on the, the, the availability of role models from the past. Role models, schmoll models, the, the fact of the matter is every human uh, stands on their own two feet. They either choose to succeed or they choose not to succeed. And the fact that someone of the same color mm -hmm. succeeded or failed is no reflection on you. You know, you got a point there. Um, just to sum it up, we're talking during the break about the whole issue of character education, and you were saying, well, how dare one race see themselves as superior to another. Uh, unfortunately, that's what we're grappling with. I remember once, and I'm trying to sum all this up very quickly, we, we, we've had a guest on, Denise Jones. She said she chose to send her child to a black doctor. I understood this because I think in, there's a reality out there. Uh, a lot of the black population are under the impression that unless you can play basketball, sports, and I'm not putting that down, or you can, you can entertain people, you're worth nothing. Because generally speaking, the role models in the media that we've seen, and generally speaking, fine, people are used to the image of the Indian doctor, the white doctor, the Asian doctor, but when it comes to the black population... Dr. Huxtable. Well, I, I love Dr. Huxtable, okay? I love Dr. Huxtable. And yes, we have that as a role model. But generally speaking, we don't get enough of that. So I can understand the individual needs of different community members. But I also like that idea about character education that you were saying in the break to be in the schools. Yeah, I think... We all need to learn here. Right. We need to learn that the absence of a doc Dr. Huxtable doesn't mean that black people can't be doctors. And in fact, mm -hmm. that the, the, the fact that someone in your class happens to be black and that you happen to be white, look, you know, just because your great-grandfather was a president doesn't mean that you're able to be a president. And just because his great-grandfather wasn't a president doesn't mean he won't be the next one. So uh, we have to teach all children of all races, if you want, all human uh, children, let's put it that way, <laughs> that uh, they've got to respect every human being as a human being. But what do you do about the Yolandas of the world, that she comes here, her child goes to school, suffers racism? I remember at one point, the Muslim Canadian Congress said, if you want to fix your problem, this was a statement they issued, widespread, if you want to fix the problem of violence then fix the racism problem. It, it's something that cannot be swept under the carpet. There are those who try to do it, but it's there, and you've got people like Yolanda, her child is in the school system, suffering prejudice, so what does that kid do? Develops an anger, goes to a group that has that same anger, and before you know it, you've got an explosion on your hands. You, need, you do need a multi-layered approach in addressing these things. Racism is a problem. That doesn't excuse the no, fact it does that, not excuse. That, that if you are a victim, that you, know, you have no personal responsibility to how you react. You, there's racism, then there's responses to racism. Yes. But just to say we're going we're we're to pursue a, a, an agenda of what I call entitlement to say, you know, I need this because I'm a, it's a, I, I'm a, spe that I have a specific wrong. case. You cannot excuse that's a, that. That's a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. because, so just like, oh, you know, you have have to give me this hands up because I'm just so much more disadvantaged than this other person. I think that that's a cop out. You know, I was functionally literate until I was in grade 10. And you know what? I I had a person who was willing to help me, but I you had to step up and though. meet the challenge. You were fortunate. And this Not is something really. you have it. This is no, but you were fortunate in that you had people that went to bat for you. You were at a point in life, and you've said this on air yeah. before, so I'm not revealing any secrets here, yeah. that you pulled a gun on somebody once and right you felt a sense of, of empowerment. Yes. 
when you did that. Absolutely, because, because, because that was the leveling instrument at the time. But when I had a, a man a couple of years later who showed that he cared about me and he did that in, 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 a, in a very uh, real um, and deep way, then I realized I don't need that because I gained my sense of empowerment. You know, I, I'm not way. supporting Afrocentric schools, but I'm wondering, is that the issue they're trying to deal with here? Well, we're talking Show these children that they care? in terms of their background, in terms of their race, but one of the to try to deal with a, a problem education. that we're all facing. I mean, nobody wants to walk down the road and wonder, am I going to be hit by a stray bullet next? Well, you, you, and I, you, I, talked being, about, you talked about yes. character education. Yes, a, I did. An important component of character education is role modeling. Right? Certainly. It is, it is role modeling. And there, do, there does need to be positive role models. I'll tell you, with, with, in Brampton Neighborhood Resource Center, the president of our board um, is a man of color. And I can tell you that when some of the more challenged youth come in to our facility, and I introduce um, Len Carby as the president of, of our resource center, they meet him and they go, you're the president of this, this, this hmm. incredible organization? Because the, the, and these young men of color see another, this man of color who, who had a history uh, as an administrator for the Montreal Stock Exchange, and, and now he, he's an entrepreneur, and, and, and so they see him in this light. And so this really, it's important. And, 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 his, and then his character, in turn, the way he presents himself, shows them, wow, this is a way of conduct. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's talk about that for a sec. Yes. What you're saying is that these people who never thought that a person of his uh, genetic mm -hmm. makeup would ever be a president, the problem is that they're surprised. Exactly. They should never be surprised. And they that's the point there. Right. They shouldn't need... In itself. Need, right. In itself. The fact that, that, that a role model helps people to be surprised and break down, that is a, not so much a cure as mm -hmm. a way of, 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 of identifying that, oh my goodness, we've got a problem here. And the problem is, no one should ever have to go through life thinking, well, if I haven't seen one that's the same color as me, I can't be like that. From the get-go, we have to say, even if you've never seen anybody like you do it, you're just as likely as any other hard-working uh, thinking person to succeed. Do not value your race, whether for the positive or for the negative. It is of no consequence. We should never be saying, wow, look, a green person can do that. Mm -hmm. we, we should be living our whole yes. life as though, sure, maybe yes. a pers purple person but will we're too. we're not there yet, and I think, and we're, I not think we're not there yet, and I think in the interim. Look, Martin Luther King is a role model mm -hmm. to all people. Um, Gandhi was a role model to all people. Whether you know, we're going to have to get you to hold that thought, Anthony, because we must go for a break now. We'll be back to you on the phone lines after this. Stay tuned. Hello again and welcome back to Viewpoints on the Line. Wow, time goes on pretty quick. Today we're talking about a sensitive subject right now, Afrocentric schools. Many of you are waiting on the phone lines. So we're going to get to you. We're going to ask that you make your comment as short as you can so that we can get to all of you. Let's go now to Antoinette on line six. Hello, you're on the line. Hello, Christine and guests. Yep, we're here. Yes, I'm for Afrocentric schools and that is, this is the reason. If other races can have their own schools, so can um, uh, the, the black people, because that is a way of teaching our kids to know about more about their culture and to educate them that they can be something terrific in life, because the white schools or other schools can't teach them that. First of all, they don't have black history in school. They don't teach them those things. They don't teach the culture. So why not an Afrocentric school? Okay, so you're not talking about white schools as such, you're talking about curriculums that base the history on the European culture. Is this what you're referring to? Because when you look at Toronto schools, they're very multicultural. They don't teach anything to the black kids about... about the, you're history. talking about the curriculum. It's, it's, all, it's all about white history. Mm -hmm. Teach them what they need to know. Antoinette, thanks for your comment. Let's go now to Tamara on line 8. Hello, Tamara. You're on the line. Uh, hello, Christine and yeah. guests. I am a Holocaust survivor, and I'm going to schools and teaching the children not to bully, teach the children to respect each other and to respect each other's race and religious orientation. Tamara, good for you. Please send me a personal email, okay, Tamara? I'm going to be looking for that one. Thanks for calling. Let's go now to Dan on line five. Hello, Dan. You're on the line. Hi. I'm a black male myself, and I'm not in support of Afrocentric schools. Two things. I have a two daughters, a four and an eight-year-old daughter, and my two daughters going to a Catholic school. They're the only two black 
daughters and uh, child in, in the Catholic school, my daughter came home and said that I want to be white, comb my hair like a white child. No, I think that's the problem because of the Catholic school is segregated and if you're not Catholic, therefore you cannot go there. A lot of black parents are not Catholic, so therefore their kids are not going and so are other races. Now, if we have um, uh, Afro Afrocentric schools, which would uh, mainly consist of blacks, then the white child or the Chinese child that attend in that school probably will have the same problem because asking questions that are hard to, uh, to answer. Dan, thank you for your call. Let's go now to Marie on line one. Hello, Marie. You're on the line. Go ahead, Marie. Hello. Hello, Marie. You're on the line. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. I just want to say um, I'm from the Caribbean, and I have a son in school. Uh, when he came here to Canada and started going to school here, his first question was like, um, Mom, are there any black persons on or team players on the hockey team? Mm -hmm. Right. He started to enjoy hockey and he was watching hockey and all that. And that was his first question. His second question was like, we started going to the Mandarin uh, restaurant and his third visit, he said, why aren't there any black persons in this restaurant? Mm -hmm. And his other issue was that when he joined that first school, we're living in a Jewish neighborhood and he loved soccer. Mm -hmm. And he came home and he was crying and he said, Mom, these boys won't let me play with them. And I said, you know, you're, you're new, so, you know, you'll get to know them later on. Marie, where do you stand on the Afrocentric schools? I'm sorry? Where do you stand on that issue? Are you in support uh, for them? At first, I, I, I was kind of against it, but now I'm it? starting to think that clear, probably we should have... Marie, thank you for your call. We're running along in time here. Let's go now to Lena on line 7. Hello, Lena. You're on the line. Go ahead, Lena. Let's go to Chantal on line six. Hello, Chantal. You're on the line. Hello. Hello, Chantal. Go ahead. I just wanted to know. I hear, like, all you guys are talking about what you guys think is right or what, what, what adults think is appropriate. I'm hearing what you think is right. That's why you're calling in, Chantal. Let's hear it. I want to know who's surveying the youth to ask them what they think about Afrocentric schools and Good. how they feel about this. Yes. Good question. Yeah, now, you work a lot with you, youth. Well, and, I, and, and that's what I said. I, I was I, on yes, with Michael Enright, uh, and it'll be on CBC uh -huh. on Sunday mornings. But it, 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 the thing is, that's what I said. We, we, he, Michael Enright said to me, what, how are we going to address this? And I said, we need to ask the kids. And that's what I do. And I will tell you, Christine, I spent half of my early years from uh, kindergarten to grade 12, half being the only person of color in a classroom. Mm. And, and there was a couple of years where I was the only person of color in my school growing up in Vancouver. And so I, and I can assure you that hockey is my favorite sport. And I'll, the first time I ever saw Grant Fear play, mm -hmm. I was really happy to see a person of color actually on the ice. But I, I, I still played hockey. Um, I still struggled through the f fact that everybody was white and I wasn't. But for me, if somebody said to me, well, you know, do you want more people who look like you, is that going to solve the problem? No. What but was going to solve you, the problem? What do you think the kids would say? I mean, kids really differ when it comes kids, to that. If you're a kid that maybe you're bitter, um, and I'm talking any color respect. kid, they you are. might tend to segregate and go with your own. And I'm not talking necessarily one race here. Right. You've got a lot of segregation going on, period. Some I, schools, it's the Muslim kids that stick together, and they want to. So you ask them, what do they want? They'll say, sure, I want to stick together with my group. Or you have a school that maybe the white kids stick together. Oh, it's great. Let them have their school. I want to be together in my white group. I'm talking about when you see a situation with segregation among youth, they're going to probably say, I'm for it. But is it the best thing? I'm not sure. I think absolutely not. I think that's a perfect example. I think we're born with these sort of tribalist instincts. You know, I hang we with flock. the white guy. Yeah, we, we fuck. Flock. And that's what we as adults <laughs> owe to the children. Mm -hmm. The lesson that tribalism, this, this collectivist idea, this racist, yeah. inherently racist yeah. idea, is wrong, it's lowly, it's for the stupid, the, the, oh, those who, like who are unwilling to I, think. I like that. And that these children need to learn to look beyond these concrete irrelevancies. Like he wears a red shirt and I wear a blue one. Irrelevant. He's white skin, I'm black. Irrelevant. What's yep. relevant is, is, does this person have a good character? Do they, are, they, are they a person I can trust and rely on? We need yes. to teach them what is valuable in a human being and what is irrelevant. That, and I, but I, but, but I think also you have to look at what the first caller who called in, her, her concern is, well, there are, you know, we need to have schools that can teach this. Well, there is an Afrocentric school in Toronto, first of all. It's a private one. And I'm all for a private school of any kind, whether it be a Jewish you know one what? or Anthony, a... Anthony, I like that point you're making. We're just short on time, but I like that point. That's another point, food for thought. Now, we're going to have to go for a break now. I mean, most of our time got eaten up for good reason on this issue, but there's another issue that we want to talk about. Imagine 
A Spanish man stopped by the cops for impaired driving. No interpreter present. The judge eventually rules, well, the charges are thrown out. Want to hear what you think about that as well? We'll be back after this. Stay tuned.